Assignment or teaching time. If you could turn with me to the book of 2 Peter where we continue our journey. We almost come to an end. A journey that I was hoping to take over a week or two has been quite a few weeks. <coughs> so I can find my glasses. I can see what I'm doing. Lou, stop laughing at me. <laughs> nothing, nothing better than having a congregation member laugh at you while you're busy. Takes away all your self-esteem. Our journey is through these qualities. Remember, we said there were seven qualities that, that um, Peter is calling us to grow in. And we're almost at the end of them. But he says to us, let me remind you, make every effort. 2 Peter chapter 1. Every effort. You must take ownership of these and you've got to put in the hard work. You've got to diligently seek these qualities. Too often as Christians, we, we get saved, we get baptized, we come to church, and then for the next 50 or 60 years, we sit in our chair and we listen to sermons after sermon after sermon. I think there are many of us sitting here that could say, I have heard many sermons over the years, and very few have actually taken any root. And, and that can be for various reasons. Maybe the sermons weren't so good, maybe they weren't practical enough, but for many of us, they don't take root because we don't take ownership of the sermon. We don't come to the point of saying, what is the pastor saying? What is scripture saying to me? How do I put this into my life? How do I make this real for me? That's what, what Peter is saying. You have to make every effort to add these things to your life. In other words, a Christian journey takes hard work. It takes the slog of Bible study. It takes the slog of prayer, of worship, of praise, all those things so that we can grow. It's not just a once-off get saved and then I just must sit. You know that thing, sometimes I just sit. Too many of the church just sits. And then we wonder why things go wrong. When we get to chapter 2 and we start looking again at false teachers, we wonder why. Because the people in the church haven't diligently sought to add to their faith. That's just been a one-sided teaching all the time. And so he's saying, make every effort, work hard to add to your faith. So he's talking to people that are saved. Too often we want to discriminate and say, those guys better get saved, which is true. But when you're saved, what, are you, what about them? So he's talking to Christians and he's saying to them, you guys as Christians are slack. He's talking to me too. You slack about your own growth, about your own maturity, about your own advancing in the things of God. And so quickly we've gone through goodness, virtue, moral excellence, stepping up in our God qualities knowledge in our heads and in our hearts too often our knowledge is all in our heads that's what Charissa was saying to us so often we can get baptized even because everything's in our head and we know all the right answers but it's for the wrong reason with what's going on inside of us self-control Jordan shared around this remember your desires do not control you you control your desires for too many of us it's the other way around Perseverance, Jordan shared this one too. Standing firm, even through the rough times, right to the end. Standing firm, even through the rough times, right to the end. And then godliness, we looked at last week, getting to the place of spiritual discipline. Looking at things like silence and solitude. Spending time away from the crowds. Spending time just in God's presence. Not speaking, but listening. Thing we don't do very well. And all the others that we have to practice, worship, a whole lifestyle of worship, study of the scriptures. Are we even taking time for that? <coughs> this morning we move on to another one. Make every effort to add to your faith brotherly kindness. Make every effort to add to your faith brotherly kindness. You can read the whole passage again for this morning. We normally read it every week, but I'm looking at the time. Make every effort to add to your faith brotherly kindness. Or some of your, your interpretation might say mutual affection in your, in your um, translation that you have. And, and I was thinking, how do you actually explain brotherly kindness without me just saying to you, love each other? Love each other. That's the sermon. Let's go and baptize Sharissa. <laughs> the problem is, for many of us, we don't fully understand what it means, love each other. Because our whole concept of what it means to love each other has been warped. We are called, you and I, we are called and we are commanded and we are expected to love each other. 
especially within the church. But that is something that is sadly, sadly lacking for us. How many so-called Christians do we know, do we see, even within our own body, that say they love God, they profess that they love God, but in their actions, we see something very different. We see something vastly different, the way they treat people within the church, and especially the way they treat people outside of the church. What they're actually displaying is not a love for each other, but they're actually, by not getting involved and loving their neighbor, they are actually saying, I hate my neighbor. That's what they're saying. And you can go and read 1 John chapter 4, where John says, if you do not love your brother, you actually hate your brother, and you are a liar. And the church is full of us. At times, I'm not saying every moment of every day with these you know, kind of hippie people that just love everybody. But we've got to practice this whole quality or this characteristic of loving each other as much as we can. It's because as Christians, our love distinguishes us from others. Our love distinguishes us from the world out there. It's one of our discipleship characteristics. And I can't help you, in a way, practice this love here. You can only do that within your cell group context. With each other, in your smaller group, loving each other, working with each other, encouraging each other. So, again, if you're not part of a cell group, I've got to ask you, why not? How do you exercise your gifts? How are you loving and how are you being loved? Because this is too big a group to do it every week. I can't do it yet. It distinguishes us from others and Peter goes on into the next chapter and he starts talking about false teachers because the false teachers of that time they were teaching one thing but their lives reflected something very different and they were reflecting an unloving attitude and in a way they were devouring each other just as the church does when people are down we devour them instead of loving them Peter writes in this passage in verse 3 his divine power, remember when we went through this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. We represent Him through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. That's what we have to reflect. And through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. His divine nature is a nature of love and grace and compassion. And so if you are saved, if you are saved, and only you really know that, if you are saved, then you share in this divine nature. Then you must have a Christ character. Have you? Your Christ character is reflected by your behavior. And if we want to show our Christ character through our brotherly kindness, then we've got to look past certain things. We've got to look past the difference in our cultures. We've got to look past our difference in our languages and our races. We've got to look past our differences in our social classes and even in our genders. I, I, know I get myself into trouble with many theologians because I find discrimination in the church horrific when it comes to gender. But we call ourselves Christ people. But we discriminate even within the church. We've got to put aside these things. Brotherly kindness says to us, put aside gossip. Put aside prejudice. Put aside racism. Put aside sexism. Put aside religiosity. And for many of us within the church, put away your narrow-mindedness. Because we are just so many, so narrow-minded that we cannot see beyond what we think is right. Learning to accept each other is going to be hard. It's going to be hard, but if we call ourselves saved people, we call ourselves Christians, call ourselves disciples, then we have to look at each other. We've got to look around us, at those sitting around us, and say, that person next to me, no matter what their race, culture, creed, gender, and, and even their sexual orientation, we've got to look at them and say, they are new creations in Christ, just like me, sinners, just like me. And that's a challenge for us. I'm not saying we're going to open our doors. But what I'm saying is we've got to change our attitude if we're looking at brotherly kindness to those around us. We discriminate far more than we accept. 
There's th certain things we look at and we don't condone, but we still show love and we show grace and we show compa uh, compassion. Jesus had to deal with this very same issue many times. And in the one, the one we're going to look at today, he's dealing with a lawyer. And this lawyer is trying his hardest to catch Jesus. I think by now he's probably learned, should have learned their lesson. That everyone who tried to put him on the spot and catch him came off second best. Luke chapter 10 is what we're actually going to look at today. Because that deals with brotherly kindness. A story you all know so well. Luke chapter 10, 25 is the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus uses this to explain brotherly kindness because it's perfect. He doesn't need to go in some, into some long theological tirade. He just needs to tell a story about people. As we read through this, we should be asking ourselves, how do I live out my Christian faith in a way that is real and effective? As you sit here, how do I live out my Christian faith in a way that is real and effective? Where you find yourself every day of the week, whether it's at work or at school or in your, your retirement complex or in your home as a mom or a dad, whichever one you are, how do you live out your faith in a real way, an authentic way? Because Peter says, we're going to get to this in two weeks' time. Verse 8, if you possess these qualities, one of them being brotherly kindness, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we want to be effective, we've got to be growing in them. But then we've got to be asking ourselves, well, how do I do this every day of my life? How do I reflect these Christ qualities in the way I live? Luke chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. That's this lawyer. He wanted to justify himself and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. When we read this, we should almost be saying, this story has put me on the spot. In my daily life, in my daily journey, no matter what my job is or where I find myself each day, this story puts me on the spot. But many would say, but Barry, this would never happen to us. But it does. Maybe not in this context of somebody lying in the gutter, but this story works itself out regularly in our lives. Not exactly the same scenario, but we have to deal with people and we have to deal with their struggles every day of our lives. So in this meeting, Jesus is chatting with these guys and he's talking and this expert in the law stands up and he asks Jesus two questions and he hasn't asked them in a good way. He hasn't asked them in any way that would be helpful, but he's asking them in a way to undermine Jesus. It says to test Jesus. That's what his whole attitude is. Trying to trap him in terms of the law so they can accuse him. The first question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
It's interesting, you say, well, why does that question need to be asked? Well, I'll say to you, you cannot practice the second question unless you've got this one right. Unless you've worked out what you need to do for, in, for um, eternal life. Without question number one, the context of the second one is lost. Who is my neighbor is the second one. So I need to deal with my salvation first. Jesus answers it. And he gives such a simple answer. What is written in the law? He asks. This man is a lawyer. So what is asking the law? How do you read it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Well done, Jesus says to him. Do this and you will live. See, we've got it for us then get an understanding before we even want to consider brotherly kindness. We've got to be, as part of that process, look at our own salvation. Look at our own journey with Christ. And, and for me, the moment I, I read this question, I went straight to Acts chapter 2, verse 36, the passage we spoke about earlier on with Sharissa. Acts 2, 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, or Lord and Savior. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? If we want to be saved, brothers, what must we do? They had such a hunger and a passion for salvation. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God with, will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 of them were coming to a place of salvation. And so as we consider this thing, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and, and strength, we've got to go back to those two simple things. This Jesus that you have crucified, God has made both Lord and Savior. Is he your Lord? Have you repented? Have you come before this king, before this full authority, and bent your knee and said, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. I submit to you. We struggle with submission. We struggle with surrender because we are taught our whole lives. We stand on our own two feet. Cowboys don't cry. Take hold of your future. And the scriptures say to us, repent, fall on your knees and submit to the king. Have we done that? Have you been able to say, I love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because you cannot if you have not submitted. And you cannot if you have not repented. And when we come in that, that place of repentance and submission, then that whole part of, of salvation, of Savior, comes into play. Forgiveness, reconciliation. Have we come to that place? See, even for that lawyer, this would have been a challenge for him. It's like that rich young ruler. Lord, I want to be part of you, but I can't give up all this stuff. If you're going to love the Lord your God, and you're going to call yourself a saved person or a Christian, you've got to repent, you've got to submit, and you've got to seek forgiveness. That is the only way to salvation. And Jesus gives him the answer. and says, you've got the answer already. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. I don't think the lawyer is too, too happy with that answer. See, it puts him on the spot, as it does for you and I this morning. Because we can be sitting here saying, I come to church every week, I go to cell, I do all this stuff. But if you're not submitted, if he's not a Lord, you're in trouble. He's not, he's not too happy with this answer either. And so then he asks the second question. So who's my neighbor then? I, I can almost hear it in his voice, because that would be my kind of answer and question to him. So help me then in this understanding of who is my neighbor? Who should I have new or mutual affection for? How do I love them? Jesus tells him the story. A man was going down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho. And we know he's attacked by robbers and they strip him and they leave him half dead on the road. And if you know from history, this is a bad road. It's a dangerous road. Psalm 121 also talks about this road. I remember I can't say it in English because I'll get stuck. It comes from the Lord. 
because it's talking about this very piece of road where people would be robbed and they'd call out to their gods, they'd call out to Baal and he'd be sleeping in the mountains because he was a bit of a lazy god. History tells us he had to take afternoon naps. And so by the time they got to this piece of road, if they were journeying in, it would be a problem because their god would be sleeping and the robbers would be awake. A place you didn't want to be. But this man is attacked and three men walk past him. All of them giving us a picture of brotherly kindness. And again, as we did over Easter weekend, and we looked at all those different people and their response to the cross, we have a response here this morning. Because we all find ourselves in one of these positions this morning. Maybe we the priest, maybe we the Levite, maybe we the Samaritan. Sometimes those change. But generally we'll find ourselves in one of them. First one is the priest priest happened to be going down the road and when he saw the man he passed on the other side notice jesus doesn't say much about this guy he just says this priest came down the road he saw the man and he crosses the road and walks on the other side what he's saying very simply he goes straight to the problem he doesn't want to butter this guy them up or make it all flowery the priest has a problem he does not love his fellow man that was the problem very simple he does not love the challenge for this, for me, when I look at this, is the priest was somebody who should have been ministering to people. That was his job. So he should have even known this road very well because he would have walked it regularly, going to visit people in their homes, out in the villages. He would have been to see them. And as a priest, he should have had a heart for the broken, a heart for the lost. But he doesn't. He sees a broken, bleeding man, and he turns away, and he crosses the road, and walks on the other side. Friends, how many of us see ourselves there? Oh, there's that guy lying on the road. Oh, he doesn't smell so good. Let me go this way. Make like I don't see him. Let me quickly look at my phone. I'm just as guilty. Man comes to the window and starts knocking. You read your phone quickly because you've got a message. But the phone's not even on. The guy's not stupid. He can look through the window and see your phone doesn't even lit up. But we want to call ourselves Christians. Crosses the road. Many would say, well, the priest's job was to be working in the temple and he was carrying out the sacrifices. And the priest might have even used this as his own issue or his own excuse. I have to remain ceremonially clean. I can't get my hands dirty because then I cannot do what I need to do within the church. But that's not an excuse. Having to be ceremonially clean or distanced from, for them it would have been from the dead or from the dirty, that doesn't give me an excuse not to practice brotherly kindness. Sorry, I can't get involved with you right now. How many times, how many times have I found an excuse not to do what God asked me to do? How many times? That's, I'm asking myself, you've got to ask yourselves, how many times, even in this last week, have I found an excuse not to do what God has been asking me to do? What he's put right in front of me, in front of my eyes. We rather do what we ask than what God expects. If you want to look at this priest and say, well, what was part of his problem? The priest represents ritualistic life and ceremonies. Ritualistic life and ceremonies and not one of those can save you friends we can do all the rituals that we need to do we can do the ritual if you want to call it that of baptism we can do communion we can do all those things and never see christ the priest shows us that we can do that stuck in ceremony and ritual the second man that crosses is the levite so too he says a levite when he came to the place and saw him passed by on the other side exactly the same problem no time spent by Jesus describing this man. He just goes straight to his problem. He doesn't love either. In a way, these are God's representatives. These are the priests. These are the Levites. I could say to you, these are the pastors and the elders of the church. These are leaders of our ministries. But we don't love. He also worked in the temple. He was part of the church, if we use it in today's terms. He looked after the church. He's a chert and our A-team. They look after the church. They're busy in the church all the time. And they yell when the people are coming for help. I can't help you because I'm busy. 
even this man knew that road well. He knew the church or the temple well. He knew these places. And he too, because of who he was and what he was offering to the church, should have had a heart for the broken, but he crosses the road. I cannot help you. The priest represented ritualism and ceremony. The Levite represents legalism. The Levite rep represents legalism. And that cannot save you either. We get so caught up in following all the rules. All the, the statutes we have. We cannot do this because the constitution says we cannot. But we've got to go back to the bigger constitution. What does the Bible say? That's, that is our constitution, friends. The Bible, not the piece of paper we have in my office that says you shall, 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 shall. We use that to guide us, but the Bible tells us. Legalism will not save us. Both of these men, the priest and the Levite, are men of God. They would have take great pride in wearing their robes, in wearing their dog collars. Thank goodness we don't wear them. But they would wear dog collars. They would be wearing all the trappings of who they were. Full representatives of God. And they walked on the other side of the road. I wonder what that poor guy lying on the road thought. I was sharing with Gert yesterday. We were sitting here just chatting while the baptismal font was filling. And I said, I would love Jesus if have spoken a little bit more about the man on the ground. Or the innkeeper that received this bloody man with a Samaritan. What was going on in their minds? wonder how that bloody man, you hear what I'm saying, eh? <laughs> that bloody man felt when he looked up and he thought, the priest, thank you, Lord. And there he went. I wonder how he felt. Oh, well, the priest, maybe he was busy. <coughs> oh, there's a Levite. Praise the Lord. Oh, there he goes too. I wonder what was going on in his mind. See, both of them, both of these men, God's representatives, we could just say Christians for us. Christians, representatives of God, allowed their adherence to the law to supersede their grace. They both allowed adherence to the law to supersede grace, to supersede the needs of the people, and they missed the point of their faith. Friends, our faith is not about us. It's about God. Our faith, if we are Christians, is, is about loving God and loving our neighbor. And these two men, our pictures of you and I this morning, did neither. By walking away from that man, they said, we don't love our neighbor. And ultimately, we don't love God. We're too busy loving ourselves. They were more concerned with what was going on on the outside and what they would look like than what was happening on the inside. That's why I, I'm so in a way, glad that Charissa came forward because we could have quite happily brought her into membership today and she could have lived that lie in front of us and not one of us would have known better. Worried about, because we needed her to be baptized, to be a, a member, now we're all happy with her, not knowing that on the inside she's in turmoil and maybe living out a lie. We need to be such as Christians that we know what's going on on the inside. And again, we come back to membership. How do we know what's going on on the inside if you're not here? And you're not sharing with us. Jesus looks at these men. And he tells the story about them. But if we go to the book of Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 25. In a way he's talking about these very same people. And he says to them, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. Woe to you priest and Levite. Woe to you Christian who is not brotherly kind. You hypocrite. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish. But inside... You are full of greed and self-indulgence. That's what he's saying to these church people. Luke 11, where Luke writes, verse 39, his same um, picture of this. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but you're full of greed and wickedness. Two different men looking and seeing at what Jesus is saying, and they're both an indictment of us. You can do all the stuff on the outside and still get it wrong because Christ isn't on the inside. And that's where our brotherly kindness comes from. When are we going to stop making mistakes? Sorry, making excuses. 
I can't help that injured man. Sorry, I can't help you right now because the road we're on is dangerous. I can't stop here. It's late at night. It's dark. I can't stop. I'm in a rush. I need to get to that meeting. I, I don't want to help those guys. Barry, I know you're calling for help to feed guys every day at the door, but I'd rather on Sunday just stand at the door and greet people. Nothing wrong with greeting people at the door, but is it really getting your hands dirty with the things of God? See, those people coming in the door hopefully are all nice, and hopefully they don't smell. Hopefully they're not going to steal stuff from you. But why are those people not coming in? Is it because when they get to the door, we don't make them feel welcome? We don't say, come in, brother. Come and share with us. I'd rather help at the church door. For others, is I don't know how to, how to help. For others, are going to say, that's just a waste of our church resources. Waste of our money. There is a time when we have to stop doing that. But we need to know when God says the time is up. I can't help because it's only me. You know, one of the favorites. It's his own fault he's in that place. Why was he on that road late at night anyway? Why did he go there? He got beaten up. It's his own fault. He must suffer the consequence. I get like that sometimes. You know, if you want to be stupid, then you must feel. And then our church favorite. What's our favorite one in the church? Barry, I'm really struggling. I'll pray for you. Just praise. Oh, praise powerful. You know, sometimes we've got to feed the guy too. Sometimes we should be feeling like the lawyer when we see people around us that are struggling. The third one is the Samaritan. Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Jesus talks about a Samaritan. Your Bible might say the story or the parable of the good Samaritan. That, for a Jew, that would have been an anathema, a dichotomy. There's no such thing as a good Samaritan for them. But in a way, that's what Jesus is trying to show us, that in the Samaritan who was hated and rejected and denied was a man, of, in a way, after his own heart. The, the, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Not just unloved, but hated with a passion. You see, they came from a, a kind of questionable Jewish descent. There was a, a bit of mixing of races. And so they would have been, no ways, we need, the Jewish nation is pure. So they wouldn't have wanted anything to do with the Samaritans. They both worship in a way that it says the same God, but the Jews were saying the Samaritans have allowed other stuff in, and so they, they worship in a cult. So Jews would probably say to us as Christians today, you worship as a cult. And then on top of that, the Samaritans supported the Romans. Historically, they stood with the Romans in the oppression of the Jews. And so there were high tension between them, much anger. And so this lawyer, as a Jewish lawyer, would have been in a way quite flabbergasted. We had a story about a Jew being told by a Jewish rabbi, and the hero of the story is not a Jew. Because that's what he would have been expecting. But the hero of a Jewish story is a hated Samaritan. That's why Jesus used this example. To show us how profound it is for us to love our neighbor what it means to be brotherly kind. The injured man was a Jew, and the rescuing man was a Samaritan, sworn enemies. But the Samaritan looked past the things that would stop him from helping. He looks past the fact that the guy might be ceremonially unclean, past the fact that he's a Samaritan, past the fact that it's dark and the robbers might still be there. He looks past that. And all he sees is a man in need. All he sees is a man broken and beaten and bleeding. And Jesus is showing us a man who says to us this morning, if we're looking at brotherly kindness, compassion has no boundaries. Compassion for the broken, there's no boundaries. Mercy should never be limited by our theology. Mercy should never be limited by our theology. Grace should not be denied by our legalism. And help should not be suspended because of our perspective. And our rescue of someone should not be prevented because of race and culture. Too often we don't rescue 
because the guys aren't part of our race or our culture or even our club. Jesus was saying brotherly kindness is extended out of love. Christians do not leave people lying injured in the ditch. But we do. Friends, it's time for us to step up and start getting dirty. How often do we want to extend our brotherly kindness by doing the least that we need to do? By doing it as quick as possible. Get in, get out. And by doing it, if possible, with as little cost to us as possible. Jesus' story says you're called to far more than that. You're called to far more than the, just this quick fix. I'll pray for you. He has five bucks. Don't come back. Samaritan went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine onto his wounds, put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he takes money out of his wallet and he gives it to the innkeeper and he says, look after him, I'll pay for it. If it costs more, when I get back, I will give you some more money. But please look after him. It cost him. It wasn't just a, well, let me help you up. Yeah, I'll take you to the nearest shop or whatever. He does all the stuff beyond what is expected. It's a Samaritan. The very man that he was helping would have hated him and seen him as a second class citizen. That man probably lying on the ground would have walked past him in the street and moved to the other side of the street because he was unclean. And the Samaritan says, all of this I will do to help him. How far are we actually prepared this morning to go to help those who can't help themselves? This lawyer was challenged. The lawyer was so challenged. Which of these three men, Jesus asks him, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Look how he answers. What would your answer have been? The priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. So which one of these would have been the one who was the best neighbor? I would probably have just said the Samaritan. Look what he says. He cannot even say the name. That's how hated these men are. That's how little he wants to do with this man. Uh, uh, the, the one who had mercy. He cannot even himself to say or speak the truth. And Jesus says to him, go and do exactly what the Samaritan did. Go and break down those prejudices. Go break down those walls. Go break down those things that have separated you for so long. Go and be a neighbor to all. To all people. That lawyer was still so caught up in his prejudice. So caught up in the bondage of who he was and what he did. And you know, he could try and justify all his actions, but I believe deep down he knew what the truth was. So what about us this morning as we close off? What about us? What about you? What about me? Are we still prejudiced? Are we still racist? Are we still, and I'll put this nicely, culturally challenged? Are we still bound by our worldview of certain people? Or so we, we categorize them so quickly. We look at somebody who's scruffily dressed and we put them into a box. We look at somebody whose skin color is different, we put them into a box. Or they speak differently. And our worldview binds them. And our worldview binds us. It's time for us to start seeing people as our neighbors. We all here together. Something we've got to work on. This is one of those really challenging ones. When Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith brotherly kindness, he knew this was going to be hard. Because not in our nature to step out of our comfort zones. I want to ask you this morning, how do you see the people around you? Consider this. Who is your neighbor? I'm not talking about the people who live next door to you. About who is your neighbor? Just as this lawyer said to Jesus, well then who is our neighbor? I want you to ask yourself that same question this morning. Who is my neighbor? So that our neighborly hearts would grow. Some practical things for you quickly. If you want to grow in your neighborly heart to see people with brotherly kindness, pray for God's heart to be your heart. Number one. 
pray that God's heart would become your heart. Secondly, watch for every effort or every sorry opportunity to express that heart. Ask God for opportunities. And you might get flooded. You might actually find yourself worn out. But ask God for an opportunity. Lord, I want your heart, but the only way I'm going to grow this heart is if I actually exercise it. Thirdly, never hesitate in helping if you can. Be wise, but rather find a reason to help than not to. With that comes, be wise and discerning in who you help. Number five, so three was never hesitate. Four, be wise and discerning. Five, be generous if you can. In your help. Look at what the Samaritan did. He didn't have to do all of that, but he did. Be generous. And number six, the one we struggle with, never seek reward for your help. Never seek reward. Just do it because you can. Just do it because God says, love your neighbor as yourself. There's two negatives for you quickly. Do not allow, allow your religious spirit to deny your neighbor mercy. Do not allow your religious spirit to deny your neighbor mercy. And secondly, do not allow your legalistic spirit to deny grace. Do not allow your legalistic spirit to deny grace to your neighbor. perfect picture of that. Jesus exercised grace and mercy to us. The very ones who rejected him. My challenge as I sit and I think this through and as I did over this week, my challenge to us as Westway and as a church, not just us, but as a church, let us be sure, let us be sure and steadfast in this, that we never ever allow our theological persuasion or thinking to get in the way of compassion. Let's never allow our theological persuasion or thinking to get in the way of our compassion. On our wall, when you walk in, on the left-hand side, we are blessed to be a blessing. We are called to be like the Samaritan. And so as Jesus ended his discussion with that man, I'm going to end it the same thing with you. Go and do likewise. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Challenge to us as it always should be. Lord, I stand just as guilty as that Levite and that priest in the way we've helped, the way we've worked, the way we love, the way we care, the way we are gracious, the way we are merciful, the way we are compassionate. Help us, each of us, to look at our faith, to look at our love for each other. Help us not to be those who say, I love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, but hate our neighbors. Help us to be perfect, or not perfect, but to be good representatives of you. Holy Spirit, would you empower us? Would you equip us? Would you change us? And would you use us to the glory of the Father and of the Son? We bless you for today. As we go to the the pool now, just to, to baptize Sharissa. Lord, I pray that even in that action, as we watch her going down and coming up to this freshness, this new life, this life in obedience, I pray each of us would be stirred in our hearts. Maybe there's somebody in this congregation you would be challenging even now to say, you have not been obedient. Lord, I pray that you would work in them and they would come to that place too of maybe for the first time bending their knee and submitting to your Lordship. Again, bless you for your word. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.